So welcome everyone uh, for our third edition of Museum DIY. Uh, joining us this evening on September 28th at 7 p.m. Uh, we have Chloe and Tiffany um, and they are going to be talking uh, to us about uh, conservation. Um, so I just want to welcome everyone and give everyone a little bit of an idea about the project that we're doing here. Um, one of the things that we wanted to do is actually move a little bit more into programming and give um, museum professionals an opportunity to share their skills. So these can be you know, short segments that are 10 minutes, they can be longer in length, like half an hour, 45 minutes, but it's a way for the EMP community uh, to be able to get in some learning um, and to kind of explore um, ideas or practices that they can implement into their own careers. Uh, without having a price tag uh, associated with that. Um, so this evening, I would like to start off with a land acknowledgement. Um, this is something that the GOEM community, uh, GOEM T committee um, has recently developed. Um, and so uh, we like to say that this has been done in the spirit of the recommendations made by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The GOEMP committee respectfully shares the following land acknowledgement statement, and you can find it on our website, um, and we will be using it at the opening of our meetings and public presentations, uh, such as this evening. So the GOEMP committee acknowledges that in what is today known as the province of Ontario, we are guests who live, work, and meet on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe, Atawandaran, Haudenosaunee, Iniawak, Kanikahaga, Mati, Ottawa, Ojibwe, Onondagawa, Oneida, Potawatomi, and Wendat peoples. Some territories remain unceded while others are covered by treaties. And we strongly encourage our community members to learn the treaties in their regions of Turtle Island. We express deep gratitude that we are able to carry out our work as a committee on these territories, and we are thankful for the land and the resources we are using in our work. We honor all of the diverse Indigenous peoples who have called these territories home since time immemorial. So thank you for allowing me to share that. I am now going to go ahead um, and I'd like to formally introduce um, our presenters this evening. Uh, so I'm going to start with Chloe. Uh, so Chloe is a, uh, a photograph conservator working in the private practice in Ottawa, offering services for the preservation and conservation of fine art and archival photographs. Chloe graduated from the Institut National de Patrimonie uh, in Paris with an MA in Heritage Conservation, specialized in photographic materials in 2016. Previously, she worked at the National Gallery of Canada, the Toronto Public Library, and in several private conservation labs in Paris. Chloe is an accredited member of the Canadian Association of Professional Conservators. In 2020, she completed a research project about the effects of ethanol vapors mold remediation treatment on chroma, I'm going to say chromogenic prints um, as a visiting professional of the Canadian Conservation Institute. So welcome uh, this evening, Chloe. We also okay. have with us. We also have with us Tiffany and Moore. Tiffany is a book and archival conservator working in private practice for institutions and projects in the National Capital Region. Previously, she was a fellow at the Canadian Conservation Institute and has worked at the York Explore Library and Archives and the House of Lords Parliamentary Archives in the UK. She graduated from West Dean College with an MA in conservation of books and, material, and library materials. Her current research focus is mold in cultural heritage. She recently completed a one-year project on the topic of using ATP swab devices to detect mold in archival context and is currently working on framework, frameworks for decision-making and identifying health risks in mold remediation projects. Welcome, Tiffany. So I'm now going to hand it over um, to Chloe um, and Tiffany as well. Um, and uh, I'll let you go on with the presentation. Thank you so much for both of you for being here this evening. 
Can you see my screen? Yes. It's working? Awesome. So good evening, everyone. Um, tonight, Tiffany and I are going to talk about mold in cultural heritage institutions. So we know that mold can seem like a scary or complex topic. And so the goal of this presentation is to give you a brief overview of this topic as a general. And we're gonna talk about what mold are, how to identify mold, how to prevent them from starting, and then what to do if you find them in your collection. The goal being that you'd be more comfortable if you encounter this kind of situation. So what is mold? Mold is a common term from the English language that is used to describe filamentous fungal species that belong to the fungi kingdom. So as you can see on the right, the classification of all living species is divided in different categories and the kingdom is the third one from the top. So it's a pretty broad general term that encompasses a lot of other categories and underneath it. So mold is everywhere. Around us in the air, you have a lot of airborne mold particles and also spores. Spores are the reproductive cells of mold and they are very, they're very tiny and they're very light and they can't, um, you can't see them with your eyes, but they're here. And as long as they are in the air, they cannot, um, they, can, they cannot grow. They need to find a substrate, deposit on it, a substrate, sorry. Whew. They need to find a support to deposit on itself and then use it as a nutrient source to germinate then grow. They grow forming filaments that are called hyphase. And then when they have grown enough, they will um, create more spores to reproduce. So I'm going to quickly go over some terminology that we are going to talk use tonight with Tiffany. So viable and non-viable to designate mold that is able or unable to grow, active or inactive mold for mold that is currently growing or currently not growing. We recommend that you avoid using the word dormant as it refers to a very specific technical state of mold spores and is often confused with inactive mold. So how do you identify mold? Mold will look different depending on the species, but also on the substrate on, on which it grows. So here in these three pictures, you can see that the same mold species on different types of materials will not look exactly the same. That being said, it's from a conservation perspective, it is not important to identify the species you have. So what, what do you need to look for? If the mold is active, then it will look like a further growth, a bit like you have on your fruits and veggies when they grow moldy. But if it has had time to dry out or it's, if it's inactive, then it's gonna be more powdery or stains like in the bottom left picture. In all cases, it can be different colors. You have white and browns that are typical, but you can also have purple or red. Sometimes the mold is visible very slightly, like on the image on the right, where you have a change in the gloss. So you all the, um, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but like the circle stains here are, um, that are a bit more matte, these are mold growth. So in these two cases, it's very, it's, it's not very visible that you have mold and you have to train your eye to get used to it and be able to see it and identify that as mold. But in some cases, it's more severe and way more obvious that you have mold. So one thing to keep in mind is that not all stains are mold. You are looking for a very specific shape that is round with a central spore and radiating and branching hyphase going from the spore outward. To make sure that the shape you're looking at is mold, you can use a magnifying glass. And as you can see, already with a small handheld magnifier, which is only time stand in the center image, then you can already see the shape 
of the mold growth. Of course, if you have bigger magnification like times 30 or even more, then it's even easier to distinguish the shape. You can also use UV light because some mold species will fluoresce under UV. And so it will appear sometimes more distinct it will sometimes be more distinguishable. For example, on the right, you have in reflected life, in reflected light, the pages of a book where the paper is a light cream color and the mold growth is slight brown, light brown. But if you look at the same page under UV light uh, in the bottom image, then you can see that the mold is much easily identific identifiable because of it fluoresces a lighter blue than the paper, so you can see where it is exactly and the shape of it. Another element that is a good indication that what you're looking at is mold is if you have signs of humidity. Because mold like a humid environment to grow, so any tie lines, cockling, rust, or even wet materials are good indicators that the stains or changing gloss or growth that you see is mold. Yet another good indicator is going to be where you see the growth or the stain. Mold like low air circulation. So any spot that's behind a frame or an, an in the inside of a book like on the image on the right, then are more likely to see mold growth that the more accessible places with a higher air circulation, like the edges of book pages, like you have in the two images in the left. In all cases, if you have a doubt whether or not the document or object you're looking at is moldy, it's better to treat it as mold and ask for um, the opinion of a conservator that has experience with mold so they can help you make sure that what you are dealing with is mold or it is not and how to deal with it. So now that we know what molds look like, how do you prevent it from starting? First thing is to control the climate. Mold needs a humid but also warm condition to grow. But that being said, it will still grow in a less favorable climate. It's just gonna grow more slowly. So we recommend that you keep your relative humidity under 60% and your temperature under 20 degrees Celsius. It's also important to keep good air circulation. First, to avoid the spores from settling on a substrate on which to grow, but also that because it's going to prevent the condensation of water. And condensation of water will create a localized high humidity, which is favorable for mold growth. The second point is to clean regularly. By cleaning, you're going to remove the dust and dust is hygroscopic and will do the same thing as water condensation, which is localized higher humidity, which promotes mold growth. Lastly, we recommend that you inspect regularly to detect the mold growth as early as possible. This can be done with the housekeeping. So at the same time as you dust your collection space, then you can keep an eye open for signs of mold and that you track and document where you find the mold. So tracking helps to identify trends in where the mold grow. So for example, if you find that mold is regularly growing in one specific area of your collection space, then maybe it's because there is a specific problem in this area that creates a more favorable conditions for the mold to grow. And then that documenting is allowing you to follow the evolution of the mold growth. And so you can see if it's growing slowly or more quickly. Passing on to Tiffany to tell you what to do. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Thank you. Sorry, I can't see my own screen, so I don't know if I'm uh, on there. All right, so thank you, Chloe. So this section is just a brief overview of the steps to take if you find mold in your collections. So I'll describe them overall on this slide and then go into a bit more detail as we go on. Um, as a note, 
Um, I'll be referring to a few times to a very good overall resource on mold in collections published by the CCI, so that's the Canadian Conservation Institute, called Technical Bulletin 26, um, dash mold prevention and collection recovery, but I'll probably refer to it as TB26 for short. Um, all right, so before we start, I just also want to make a little common sense reminder that in situations with large scale damage, such as flood or fire, where a mold outbreak is the secondary outcome of um, this incident, the primary situation should be dealt with following salvage and recovery guidance. So just making sure to address all the causative and safety issues before you get into the mold remediation. Okay, so what do you do if you find mold? There's four overarching steps with a possible fifth step. So firstly, Protect staff by encountering, uh, protect staff encountering mold by wearing PPE or other biosafety measures. Um, Chloe will talk a bit more about PPE in a few minutes, but I wanted to mention that um, staff or individuals with allergies, asthma, or otherwise in high risk health groups should not handle uh, or clean mold infested objects. Um, all right, secondly on the list, the mold damage items or the outbreak must be isolated from the rest of the collection. Um, thirdly, within a short time period, any active mold growth, so generally uh, mold on anything that's wet or moist, needs to be halted or placed in stasis to buy more time. And these first three stages should be carried out as quickly as the circumstances allow. Once the active mold growth is stopped, then the next step is to clean or contain the mold in order to minimize the risk to human health. And then I've just added this optional fifth step here, which is to render the mold non-viable. And that, in other words, to kill the remaining mold in the item. But I'm not going to go into this in detail today because the processes um, generally need to be carried out by a conservator to avoid damage on the artifact. All right, so what can the actual workflow look like? Um, I've made a little simplified chart here which shows several remediation paths. So after finding, you isolate, and then you can decide if it's possible to deal with the mold in-house or to ask for more help. Um, in small mold outbreaks, trained museum staff um, may be able to handle many of the recovery steps. Um, however, in larger outbreaks, the current Canadian guidance for, uh, for mold remediation says that if there's more than four square meters of visible mold, um, assistance from re remediation professionals is recommended. And this is because there's specific containment, PPE, and air filtration that's needed to keep everyone safe. There are remediation companies that can be hired for this, which are listed on the Technical Bulletin 26, but I would also recommend for, um, to consult with an experienced uh, conservator who's dealt with mold before, since the techniques used by buildings specialists um, for buildings, which is great, will not play nicely with artifacts, which will have different requirements. Um, from there, you have your options to either dry uh, immediately or to buy more time before drying, um, before going on to the remaining stages. And I want to note that at the second isolate point highlighted here, um, after the material is completely dried, these items can be held in isolation for any amount of time until it's possible to carry out cleaning, with the caveat that they're stored in a stable environment that's not conducive to mold growth. And then just as a little visual indicator, though it's possible to call for outside help at any time, um, there are little checkpoints where it may be more logical. So I've indicated them here with the yellow stars and the orange stars indicate where it's uh, necessary to call in professional help. All right, so um, after that overview, I'm just going to pass you to Chloe for a bit more about ISO, uh, PPE. So the first case is if you have a large water damage, then you need, the first thing you need to make sure of is that it's safe for you to enter the building. Because there are several risks associated with structural or electrical damage to the building or even contaminated water. So in case of a large water damage, you always need to wait for the security personnel to tell you that you can go in the building. That it's safe for you to go in to work on the collection. Back to general mold protection. Old mold species will um will create uh, like can create allergies or more serious infection in human beings so the sensitivity varies from person to person as tiffany said people with asthma or chronic conditions can be more sensitive than others but it also increases with exposure so let's say that right now you're not sensitive if you are working without appropriate protection on moldy object regularly, maybe in 5, 10, 20 years, you will be more sensitive to mold. 
So in any case where you have a suspicion or confirmation of mold, you need to wear personal protective equipment or PPE, which is why I said earlier, if you're not sure that what you have is mold, it's better to treat it as mold, protect yourself with PPE, and then ask for a confirmation that it's mold rather than go on without any PPE. So when I say PPE, you need to protect your airways, your eyes, and your skin. So for the airways, so the nose and mouth, you need to use either an N95 disposable mask or you can use reusable respirators with particulate filters. In cases where you have a strong moldy smell, then you will need to use combine, combined particulate and organic vapor filters. For your eyes, you should wear protective goggles and for your skin, you should at least wear disposable gloves and in case of a larger outbreak, you can add to that protective clothing, such as an apron or sleeves or even the full suit, if it's a very, very big contamination. It's often more convenient to use disposable PPE because once you're done with it, you remove it, you put it in a bag, you close the bag, and then it can be discarded with regular garbage. Whereas if you are using reusable, PPE, then you need to clean it after. So once you've ensured that everyone is safe, the next step is to isolate. Thank you. Um, so isolating, um, during all stages, the moldy artifacts and potentially the area with the mold outbreak will need to be isolated or blocked off. Um, and this is to prevent the mold from spreading to yourself and the surrounding areas. Um, as a quick note for items which are wet, damp, moist, um, isolation should be a temporary measure uh, before the items are dried and this is because in the right conditions uh, mold can start to grow within 48 to 72 hours or if there's a little bit of mold it can get worse quite quickly. Um, so by following the uh, next stages as soon as you are able to within the circumstances is necessary. So how to? Um, some techniques to isolate mold items include bagging, wrapping or boxing the affected items. If the items are wet, um, make sure to use additional support underneath when handling it as they can be fragile or get damaged quite easily. Um, more information on handling is usually found in the salvage recovery literature. For larger outbreaks, um, the collection area can be isolated uh, and the artifacts transferred out to a separate workspace. And this is to be able to dry out the, both the room and the items. Um, any work should be conducted in a fume hood, a biosafety cabinet, or in a room with return air vents blocked um, and an open window. Or potentially if the weather is nice, um, you can work outdoors under cover. Uh, just make sure you're away from the building air intakes. Um, once the items are fully dried, you can keep, uh, as I mentioned before, objects in bags or sealed containers until the physical cleaning can take place. Um, and just as a last note, it's really important to make sure that all the packages are labeled appropriately so that it's easy uh, to, it's quick and easy to identify the contents. Um, this example on the right I found um, from a blog by the Edmonton City Archives showing isolating of wet water damaged items. And the photo shows um, just a nice uh, labeling, bagging and photographing of the items during a recovery project. So you can read a bit more about that on their blog if you want to. Um, these are just some images of items which are fully dried and have been isolated. So the top two images in the left are example, or on the top, sorry, are examples in polyethylene secured with tape um, with caution and identification labels and they're awaiting cleaning. Um, I'll note that the bindings in the left-hand photo are just stacked a little bit too high. Um, a cheaper option, if that's all that's available to you, maybe to wrap the binding or the object in paper as a temporary isolation measure, as long as it's not left there for too long. So what do we do if the material is both moldy and wet? Um, in these cases, the active mold growth needs to be stopped. And this is done by getting rid of the extra moisture, which made it start growing in the first place. So in other words, drying out the items will stop the mold growth. Without drying, it's also not possible to clean the mold as it will both smear and continue growing. There's detailed techniques on how to dry in salvage recovery literature, but as an overview for this presentation, um, some key points include gently blotting with absorbent material if the surface is intact enough um, and not fragile, 
uh, increasing air circulation as well as reducing air moisture with dehumidifiers or fans. And this all needs to be done while aiming to contain the spread of mold particulates. So as an example, doing this in a separate space where the air can't be recirculated back into your um, systems is one possibility. If there's a really high volume of material that's wet or damp, it's possible to wrap or freeze some types of items as this will halt the mold growth and buy you more time until they can be slowly thawed in order to air dry or they can be freeze dried with specialized equipment. Um, but I just want to note that not all materials can be frozen. Um, and so you might want to check the salvage guides or contacting specialists who will give you more information. Generally, painted items, uh, some types of photographic material, per, per, particularly if they're glass or metal, plant specimens or other objects with high water content and any audiovisual material cannot be frozen. So after your material is dried, the next step is to make sure that the items are cleaned and or contained in some way so that the mold particulates are no longer a risk to human health during use. Um, the reason for cleaning and containing is that in current health guidances, um, there shows that there's no safe level of mold exposure. In general, we need to reduce or eliminate uh, as much contact with the mold as possible. So I'll talk a little bit about the process overall in the next few slides and then talk about cases where cleaning can potentially be done in house without calling for extra help. So for cleaning and containing, the first step um, is pretty obvious, but collection storage spaces and all surfaces and furnishings need to be cleaned before returning any collection items to them. This is a really relatively straightforward procedure, so I won't go into it in great detail, but using techniques to avoid stirring up dust and spreading mold into the air is the most preferable. For artifacts or collection material, mold damaged items either have to be cleaned enough so there's no residues remaining on the surface of the artifact after cleaning. Um, and this is generally only possible when the surface of the artifact is intact without too much damage, such as holes or severe staining or the surface is really fragile and soft. For severe cases, um, sometimes sending it to a specialist who may be able to clean it more thoroughly without damaging the artifact is an option, um, but it's not always possible to clean something thoroughly enough. And if it can't cl be cleaned enough, for example, if the item is too fragile for a thorough cleaning, then it also needs to be contained. So this can be something as simple as encapsulating um, your item in polyester, or it could be a solution as simple as only consulting the material under a fume hood while wearing PPE or other biosafety measures. Um, and I want to mention that this is a really simplified uh, review of a framework created by myself and CCI conservator Crystal Maitland for decision making about mold remediation and health risks and cultural heritage. Um, we haven't published yet, but we're hoping to. So for now, if you're interested in more detailed information, please feel free to contact me about it. All right. After cleaning and or containing, the items have to be stored in stable environments or environments that are not conducive to mold growth. They'll need to be also labeled, showing that they've had previous mold damage to make sure future users can choose to wear PPE if they're sensitive or in high risk health groups. And lastly, the item should be flagged for previous mold damage in the cataloging system. And this is so you can check on the items first if there's any further water or moisture incidents. So in mild cases, mold damage can potentially be remediated in-house if you feel adequately prepared to do so. Um, examples of good uh, uh, in-house projects would be something such as a small number of moldy items, um, or just uh, an example of another example would be if you find historic mold um, in a binding, for example, which is long since dried. But before taking on these projects, if you're looking for advice beyond the literature or you want to double check your plan, you can do things like send an information request to an institution like the CCI who can provide some general advice or you can contact a conservator to help with things like consultation, setup, and training. So um, for small in-house cleaning projects, the key points to address are make sure you're wearing the appropriate PPE, work in an isolated space from the rest of the collection, a fume hood is best, or other options that we've mentioned previously, and all working surfaces should be wiped down and disinfected after the cleaning procedures. So to carry out the surface cleaning, you'll need a HEPA vacuum with an adjustable suction. Um, this is necessary to ensure that the mold particulates are trapped rather than spread around the surface of the artifact and the air. 
Um, the vacuum never gets placed directly on the artifact, so you also need some brushes to brush the surface into the uh, the surface mold into the vacuum, and potentially other surface cleaning tools like sponge erasers, depending on what type of item you're working with. Um, as with the working space, the tools should be thoroughly cleaned and disinfected after using them. There's too much to cover surface cleaning in total detail, but a very thorough resource with the steps um, to be taken can be found in TB26, the resource I've mentioned before. And the cleaning section in particular is 2.2, which I highly recommend reading before deciding if you can take it on. And remember, with cleaning, it's a matter of both um, balancing not damaging the fragile artifact with removing as much surface mold as you can. So go forward carefully, methodically, and slowly, aiming to remove the easiest, easily dislodged mold on the surface only. Um, so just some example of mild mold cases on books and paper where cleaning in-house is an option. Um, and in these images, you can see the mold is only on the surface, the paper is still quite intact and strong, and it only affects a few pages of each book. Um, this will also apply to objects or other artifacts with a small amount of surface mold. So if it's only on the surface, if it uh, seems to be easily dislodged and it's not too extensive, um, you may be able, you may feel confident to treat it in-house. Um, in these photos, the mold is a bit more extensive. For example, the paper is soft or damaged, it's contaminated throughout the bindings or it's in hard to reach places. Um, and in these cases, it's not recommended to try and clean out the, clean the mold in-house. Um, also, if the surface of artworks, if the mold is on the surface of artworks and photographic material, it should be looked at by a conservator to make sure the item doesn't get more damaged and is adequately cleaned. Um, so to finish up with the images, I've just included a few close-ups before and after mold cleaning on paper. So here, for example, is a very mild case that has been cleaned with a vacuum and brush and then gently wiped with a sponge eraser. Um, and the next one, this one is a magnification of surface mold damage that was cleaned with a vacuum and brush. And you can see that it was just on the surface because it was quite easy to um, lift off and then the surface is clean under magnification. And then for comparison, um, this is an image of a slightly more damaged paper. You can see the paper has uh, some staining and a bit more softness. Um, and the surface cleaning is not able to get rid of the mold underneath uh, the porous damaged paper. Um, in these cases, there may be a health implication. So you may choose to be careful and apply a contain solution, like I mentioned, um, in clean and or contain, so that any residual mold may not come in contact with users. You might also contact a conservator in the specialization who may know another technique to further clean the item without damage. Um, but also just as a note, it's also not often possible to remove colored staining that's left behind by the mold. But in terms of health, the main worry is the mold particulates, um, such as in the photo. Okay. And um, so for our last slide, I just want to say um, we've had a really short time to go into quite an in-depth topic, but overall to leave you with some last thoughts, mold can and should be thought of in an integrated project management way. Um, the best strategy to prevent it from happening or becoming too severe is by inspecting your collections regularly for any trouble, maintain good storage, housekeeping, and environmental control practices, develop a salvage and remediation plan, and also know how to protect yourself and your staff should any instances arise. So the resource page we mentioned um, is linked here on our website and this is so you don't have to try and copy down too many hyperlinks at once if you're interested. And if you had any further questions, whether they're general or specific, please feel free to contact us both as we both really like talking about mold. And thank you for listening. <laughs>